I'm here today with Dr. Mark Rothenberg, who's going to answer a few of our questions from patient families. Our first topic is going to be about current treatments in the clinical field. Uh, the first one's about scope frequency. So, Dr. Rothenberg, what is your recommended frequency for scopes to monitor for histopathologic changes, especially if disease and symptoms are stable? versus after making an intervention, like a change in diet or medication? Okay. So the question is the frequency of endoscopy to both diagnose and monitor patients. And this is really a, a clinical question. There's no absolute uh, answer. But in general, what we do is we, um, until a patient is stable, we will have frequent endoscopies. We typically will do them at approximately three-month intervals. When patients are stable, they be now in remission, and the medications or the diet is, is stable, and we have a good understanding of the patient's course, and we will back down the frequency of the endoscopy, and that, that may be done at approximate yearly intervals at that point in time. The next question is about differential treatment for eosinophilic esophagitis by age. Is there any difference in management of eosinophilic esophagitis or efficacy of particular medicines if eosinophilic esophagitis is diagnosed in a young patient versus an older patient with long-term untreated EOE that has progressed to fibrostenotic EOE? These are good questions, and I'm going to keep on attempting to summarize them. But basically what I think that this question is asking is, is um, what is the therapy as a function of the age of the patient? particularly some focus on the, on the fibrostenotic complications, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer to the question is that um, our research has shown that the treatment of EOE is um, similar between adults and, and, and pediatric individuals. And basically, independent of age, patients can respond to diet medi or medical management. And the types of medicines, including proton pump inhibitors, as well as uh, topical glucorticoids or even oral glucorticoids are all effective independent of age. We have, however, found that early onset EOE can be sometimes more responsive to diet than later onset EOE, particularly in adults. But the bottom line to the question is that all therapies uh, will work similarly independent of the patient age. In terms of the fibrostenotic uh, phenotype, that is one that does respond to all the therapies as well. Depending upon the severity, however, we often would generally use glucorticoids because it's, they're considered to be more acute acting and also perhaps more potent in terms of um, their anti-inflammatory effect. But that hasn't been fully researched yet. Continuing our question session, this question is about anti-interleukin-13, RCP4046. If the long-term patient continues to have a non-responsive non or refractory disease, meaning that stable remission is not achieved, what is the likelihood of a patient being able to use RPC4046, which is a monoclonal antibody against interleukin-13? Is RPC4046 continuing to show promise, and what is the access to this for those who have completed all other possible treatments? 4046 uh, is a medication, it's a biologic, it's an antibody against IL-13. It's important to note that it is in clinical trials and it's not FDA approved. The only availability of the medication is through experimental uh, protocols. Those protocols uh, or clinical trials are very limited to date. However, uh, the medication has been tested in, in phase two trials for eosinophilic esophagitis, and in fact, the results are quite promising. The medication does look to be um, effective, and, um, and, and, and it's going to be exciting to see uh, the medication hopefully develop further through uh, phase three trials. What's notable in the data that's so far obtained is that the anti 13 medication does seem to work in patients that have a prior history of steroid uh, resistance or um, steroid uh, requirements, so it does indicate that the medications uh, will be effective and difficult to treat patients. Uh, the next question is also about anti-interleukins. So what are the differences between the treatments targeting interleukin-4 and interleukin-13, such as dupilumab, and those targeting interleukin-5? Does subtype have any, an effect on choosing which route to pursue? These are all good questions um, and complicated answers. But basically, the, 
medications that in this question all fall under the category of biologics. They're antibodies that are targeting uh, different mediators of the immune response related to allergies. They all fall also in the category of precision medicine, and it's uh, very exciting to see precision medicine now being applied to the EOE field. These, this is based on understanding the molecular and cellular development or pathogenesis of the disease, and then working on uh, to develop specific blockers, in this case antibodies, against the mediators of the inflammatory response. The IL-4 uh, and IL-13 are cousin cytokines. They share a common receptor called IL-4 receptor alpha, which is the target of dupilumab. So dupilumab will block both IL-4 and IL-13. The IL-5 is an interleukin-5, which is an eosinophil growth factor that blocks the eosinophil growth factor and then suppresses the eosinophil levels and also their activation. There's also uh, other drugs related to these things, such as the benralizumab, which is FDA-approved uh, for eosinophilic asthma. That's an eosinophil-depleting antibody. It recognizes the IL-5 receptor, and it leads to the immune system uh, targeting and destroying the, the, uh, the cells that bound to the receptor uh, antibody, and, and hence uh, eosinophils are depleted from the body. They're all exciting uh, medicines. They all appear to be safe. And um, it's likely that not all the patients will uh, respond to the medicines, and that there will be subgroups um, based on um, baseline um, characteristics, including molecular and cellular um, features that the patients have in baseline. The next question is about the risks of biologics. So what are some of the long-term risks of the biologics being used now for allergic diseases and in the eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorder pipeline? How will risks and benefits be weighed for patients? In terms of the risks of these precision medicines, uh, there's some good news about that. Because the immune system that's involved in allergies is really considered to be a vestigial arm of the immune system. So here in the Western world, that part of the immune system doesn't get challenged a lot. It's not needed for um, protective immunity to a large extent. And unlike other biologics which target um, other pathways that may be more germane to essential immunology and immunity, this um, pathway that's being blocked by these biologics is really um, vestigial. It's able to be um, um, knocked out without any major consequences. And we know that from uh, preclinical studies in animals that don't have these uh, molecules. But also the fact is that the uh, early data with, with, with the biologics in, in these diseases have been very uh, safe. And, um, and if you read the package insert for um, these medications, um, for the ones at least that are FDA approved, there's not really any risk for infections. There is some warnings about um, parasite infections, that if you do have a parasite infection or you're at high risk of a parasite infection, you should be careful about not taking these medications. Um, but um, we uh, feel that these medications will be uh, very safe and not very immunosuppressive. This is all based on limited data, and more information will be collected as uh, we survey and, sur and, and have surveillance on patients uh, that are getting the medications as they become more widely used. Thank you. The next question is about food trials. When doing food trials, do they look at more than just the number? Meaning, could 14 eosinophils per high power field ever be a fail? And eosinophils per high power field ever be a pass, a 16? Mm -hmm. And when you get to these borderline numbers during the maintenance phase, it seems like there's conflicting opinions among specialists, but the implications moving forward either way could be significant. Well, as my father said over the weekend, and this is, uh, this is one of his uh, senior birthdays, he said it's just a number. Uh, his age is just a number. So I would say the same here. The number is just a number. We need to look at it in the context of the individual. and. Um, and uh, numbers of 14 and 16 are very close to 15, and they're around the threshold for diagnosing the disease. They're not biologically in itself and numerically any different in terms of really what's going on in terms of the numbers or the degree of eosinophils. However, um, they can be associated with different clinical um, presentations and different clinical scenarios. So certainly if a patient had 100 and they went to 14 or 16, I, I would probably would be impressed by that drop in that number. Whereas a patient that started at 20 that went to 14, we might be less impressed with that number. But it's not just the number, as I said, it's really the clinical context. How is the patient feeling? What is the overall uh, status of the patient, including the endoscopic findings, which are the more gross findings that are visually seen, 
And of course, the ensemble number is just one measurement of the pathology. We now measure a number of different features um, besides just the ensemble level.